Hello, this is artist and illustrator Lisa Congdon, and this is the Inspiration Place podcast with Miriam Schulman. Today's episode is sponsored by The Writer's Sketch. The Writer's Sketch is a poetry collection by Ronald Schulman with my artwork, which is being released on Amazon on August 13th. Everyone who orders it will also get the free audiobook version. This episode is also sponsored by the Unlocking Your Style ebook. This digital PDF guides you through some of the same style school exercises inside my signature online painting programs, but in a beautiful, user friendly, downloadable PDF. The ebook program includes 30 unique exercises, creative resources, and enough inspiration to either keep you busy for a monthly intensive or spread out weekly throughout the year. It's the Inspiration Place podcast with artist Miriam Shulman. Welcome to the Inspiration Place podcast, an art world inside a podcast for artists by an artist, where each week we go behind the scenes to uncover the perspiration and inspiration behind the art. And now, your host, Miriam Shulman. Well, hello, this is your host, artist Miriam Shulman, and you're listening to Find Your Artistic Voice, which is episode number 49 of the Inspiration Place, and I'm thrilled that you're here. Today, we're talking about the journey that creatives take to find their creative voice. In this episode, you'll discover what is an artistic voice, why having a voice matters, and also some of our favorite strategies for developing your voice as an artist. But before we get there, I wanted to tell you about my Unlocking Your Style book program, which contains 30 days of exercises to unleash your creativity. When people ask me, how do you create your own style? I always tell them it's not about creating it. It's about uncovering what's already there, buried deep inside. Everyone already has their own style. They just don't always know what it is yet. Most of us have spent our entire lives putting ourselves on the back burner, which means we've never spent any time uncovering any parts of ourselves, let alone our painting style or developing our own voice as an artist. And by the way, today we will be talking about the difference between your voice as an artist as well as your artistic style. Now, if you're a regular listener, you know I don't talk a lot about specific art classes here on the podcast, but I did want to share this with you because it really has some great exercises in it to help you loosen up and lean into your own personal style, and it complements today's episode so perfectly. A year from now, I would love for you to look back and say, wow, I'm really glad that I did that. So all you have to do is go to shulmanart.com forward slash stylebook. You can use a coupon code TIP when you check out to get $18 off. Okay, now back to our show. Today's guest is a fine artist, illustrator, and author, and is best known for her colorful drawings and hand lettering. She works for clients around the world, including Crate and Barrel, Facebook, MoMA, and Harvard, among many others. Author of eight books, and here to talk to us about her latest book, Find Your Artistic Voice, The Essential Guide to Working Your Creative Magic. All the way from Portland, Oregon, please welcome to the Inspiration Place, Lisa Congdon. Well, hello, Lisa, and welcome to the show. Thank you. It's so great to be here with you. I'm so glad you're here. So I wanted to, first of all, thank you for, you're 50, right? 51. Yeah, 51. Okay, I just turned 50, and you put some post out, like how your glasses got weirder. Do you remember that? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh-huh. I was like, great idea. I'm doing that. Not that I copied your glasses, obviously, but I was like, I'm getting weird glasses for my 50th birthday. Not that they're so weird, but that's the way to go. Well, I also think we get a little braver when we get older. And that's sort of what happened to me. Like, I just started not caring. Like, I always wanted to wear weird glasses, but I, maybe part of me was afraid that people would think it was silly. Yeah, And now I, don't, now I don't care. So, you know, I noticed actually what your audience doesn't know is that we can see each other and you have this amazing purple lipstick on and I'm like, see, another example. That is another example. <laughs> My husband hates this lipstick. <laughs> I, didn't wear it. I love it. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, it is another example. Um, I found that the more I act like a cartoon character, 
the more fun I'm having in life and people enjoy it too. So heck. Exactly. I heard this interview between Krista Tippett of On Being and Mary Oliver, poet Mary Oliver, who just passed away actually this year. And they were talking about how the sort of life cycle is that when you're really young, you're super playful and you don't necessarily pay attention to what other people are thinking about you. And then most of our life we spend in this area where the opposite is true. And then you become older and you get that sort of playfulness back again. I feel like I'm just entering that phase and it sounds like you are too. So yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and then when we're really wise, we learn that nobody really cared about us all along. That's right. That's right. They That's all right. care about themselves. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I'm not sure who said that. I, I want to say Elizabeth Gilbert said that in her book, but that may not yes. be right. Anyway, this is very important to what we're talking about today because leaning into what makes us weird and different is really all about what finding our voices and our styles as artists is. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Yes. You know, you said you were talking about this class that you teach and that finding your style isn't about finding something new that's outside of yourself. It's sort of digging deep and finding what's already there. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. But I also like what you're talking about both in your book, it's a little bit deeper than just the style. Like the style might be like the glasses I wear and I put on purple lipstick and that's great. But then having a voice is different. Let's break down the first thing. How would you define having an artistic voice? What is an artistic voice? There are several components of which style is definitely one. Starting with style. So style is is often by many people used interchangeably with voice. And I think at one time I might have agreed with that. And then the deeper I dove into this topic to write this book, the more I realized that style is actually just one component of your voice. It's an important part. You know, it's sort of like all about the decisions you make about the shapes and lines and texture that you use in your work, your use of pattern and rhythm and movement, like all that stuff that makes your work yours. But, you know, voice is also your skill level and that changes over time. You know, like the more you paint or draw or write or make music or dance, no matter what your artistic medium is, the more skilled you become and skill matters. And I don't mean that in the traditional sense. And in the book, I talk a lot about like how we used to think of skill as being this very specific thing, academic definition of what it means to draw or paint well, which would be realistically or like being able to render something. But fortunately, in the last century, you know, most of the greatest artists have sort of blown that idea of skill out of the water. So it's like doing what you do well and having a certain level of consistency in your work. And I'll talk about consistency more in a second. So skill is super important. Subject matter, sort of what you choose to make art about. Sometimes that changes over time, but for a lot of people, it remains fairly consistent. We are all individually attracted to different things to rendering different things. And, and again, that might shift, but we have natural tendencies because as you said earlier, these things are already inside of you. Yeah. You know, they were forming when you were one or two or three years old. Your medium is part of your voice. Like the, what you choose to use makes a huge difference because every medium, even in the category of paint, makes things look so different and different medium have different effects and relay different emotions. I talked a little bit when I was talking about skill about consistency and that's another one. So skill is important and what skill helps us develop is a certain level of consistency. So if you're waking up every day and making a painting but it looks different, I mean that never happens because <laughs> your voice is in you. It's part of your DNA. So it's going to come out a certain way. The more skill you have, the more consistency you have in rendering your work. And that's when it becomes sort of recognizable. You know how like people will say to you, oh, Miriam, like I recognize that painting before I saw your name below it, yeah. right? Yeah. Because your work has a certain look and feel. And the same thing happens to me and happens to a million other people out there making art who, especially people who've developed their voice. So consistency is also, you know, a big, big part of it. See, now I see voice is being a little bit more than that. So style is influenced, like you said, by definitely by your skill, definitely by the medium you choose and, you know, how you are expressing your voice. But the voice to me is really what you're trying to say 
with your art. Well, that's what I mean by subject matter. So I go into more depth than what I just explained. So like, if you want to give an example, like Ernest Hemingway, just to pick a non-art subject, a non-painting subject, he had a style of these very short sentences and very simple writing, but what his voice is as a writer, it goes much deeper than just the stylistic. So when I talk about people do have, I feel they have both. Their style is something that they always had, but a voice that is also influenced by your life experiences. Right. And I go into depth in that in the book. I glossed over the the category or the component subject matter, but that's really what I mean. It's like your story. It's your voice is your story. Yeah. And what you choose to make work about. My topic heading for that is subject matter, but but underneath all of that is like your culture, your religion, your belief system, your your values, you know, all your family history, your preferences, all of that. Mm. And in some ways, that's the most important part. Yeah. So why does having a voice matter? For professional artists in particular, or people who aspire to make art professionally, whether they aspire to make money from it or not, you know, people who want to sort of be part of the arts community, having a voice, it's essential because it sort of sets you apart from other artists it helps you to, there's a little graphic in my book about, about the sort of continuous cycle of having a voice that helps sustain, you know, your professional life. You have to create something that other people are going to connect with, which then creates value. Money is exchanged. People pay you for your work. You have the time and resources to make new work that at least professionally matters. It's also like a matter of sort of standing out. I mean, I feel like there's two components to it. Like professionally, you need to stand out. But anytime you're only following what other people are doing or copying somebody else's work or even copying, heavily copying a genre of work. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's just soul sucking. Like in a way that's the opposite of having a voice because it's not coming from inside of you. It's coming from outside of you. So I feel like that's not sustainable because you would get sort of bored easily you but know also I see it happening with artists who are copying themselves does that make sense like oh, they yeah. become known for girls with red hats I'm just making this up you know girls with right. red hats right so all they're painting now are girls with red hats and they're afraid to paint something different because this is what's sustaining their career and this is what's been marketable and this is what's been working Yet they've experienced different things in their life. Now they've had a child and now they've different things have happened. And it's hard, you know, when they are stuck in that in that mode of creating for this specific market, it can also kill their voice as an artist. Absolutely. And I think that happens a lot. Like you'll notice there are artists out there or you know, I pay attention sometimes to people who it seems like their work hasn't changed in 10 years. Yeah. And then you watch their career sort of die right. a little bit. Your audience wants you to evolve. Yes. You want to evolve and your audience wants you to evolve. That's a way to stay relevant. And it's also a way to stay interested in what you're doing. Fortunately, I think more people sort of naturally evolve than don't. But I definitely think that sort of relying on yourself or what's worked for you in the past, even when you're not passionate about it anymore, like that will be obvious to others as well. So likewise, when you're joyful about what you're doing, even when you're experimenting and things are sort of looking a little crazy because you're really changing things up, it may be confusing to the people looking at your work, but it's also extremely exciting to push your work in a new direction. And I think you said this in the book, sometimes even when you do try like these different mediums, there's still certain things that come out that has your thumbprint on it. Yeah, it's like you can't get away from yourself. You try really hard sometimes. I do this all of the time and I I can't remember who I was interviewing in the book. We talked about this a little bit. Maybe it was Andy Miller. Like this idea that you, you try really hard to make work that is not necessarily mimicking another artist, but you're like trying to get a certain effect or you're trying to change things up. At the end of the day, it still ends up looking like your work. And that's because, as you said, you know, it's like your your style is already part of who you are. So change is actually harder than you think. It's easier to, to stay in your voice than it is 
to venture outside of it yeah. in some way. What's very interesting is if you go to like a figure painting portrait slash class where, where everyone's drawing the face of a model. And if you look around the room, a lot of times you can match up the drawing with the artist because somehow it resembles the artist. Do you know what yeah. I'm talking about? Yeah, totally. So that's like they always say that Leonardo da Vinci modeled the Mona Lisa after himself, which may or may not have been true. It just may be <laughs> that effect of how when we try to paint other people, it still looks a little bit like ourselves because yeah. our face is the one we look at the most. That's right. It's the most familiar to us. Yeah. yeah. So I just found that was like a little interesting slash creepy. Mm -hmm. totally. <laughs> when other people's portraits look like themselves, like they're trying to paint somebody else and it still looks like them. Right. How do you navigate influence, Lisa, yourself and still maintain your voice as an artist? And what are and who are your influences? I have so many. And like most artists, I'm constantly sort of, you know, I talk about this in the book, this like straddling the plane of independence and belonging. And mm. I know you interviewed Austin Cleon, and he talks a lot about this in his book, Steal Like an Artist. Like the goal is not necessarily to be completely original because that's impossible, right? Right. The goal is actually to take in your influences. I mean, bless our influences, honestly, because we wouldn't be artists without them. Like we wouldn't right. be inspired to make art everybody has influences. The idea is, and this gets easier over time, and we screw up a lot when we're just first starting out, but you know, the idea is to use your influences, but then figure out ways to make adjustments and to innovate and to, to make your work sort of you, right? And the fortunate thing is eventually that happens because as we've been discussing, your voice is already in you. You can't ever be as much as you might like to be your favorite artist, you will never be. So mm. I always say too, like having more than one influence is really important. Like a, a melding of influences makes your voice a little bit more of a like blended smoothie than, you know, like <laughs> a piece of fruit, right? right? So the first thing to understand is that mimicry and influence are completely normal parts of the creative journey. Yes. And no one, maybe save for some outsider artists out in the living in the middle of, you know, Arkansas, no one is immune, right? Only people who haven't come into contact with popular culture are, you know, truly uninfluenced. And those people are sort of, in some ways, like the most brilliant people because they've managed to make art without ever really seeing much art themselves. Getting over having, you know, this idea that you shouldn't have influence is, is I think the first step. My own personal influence is like my greatest influence. My most favorite artist in the world is Alexander Girard, who he's probably more known as an illustrator and a graphic designer and a surface designer than as a fine artist. I'm actually taking a pilgrimage to Santa Fe, New Mexico in August to see a show of his work at the Folk Art Museum disrupting my summer vacation to, to like pay a lot of money to go to this place to see his work. And that's, that's how important he has been in my journey. Have you been to New Mexico before? No. And I've never, and so, so obviously I've never been to Santa Fe and I'm excited about the city sort of writ large, but, and the landscape for sure. I was there two years ago, not Santa Fe. I somehow skipped that and went straight to the mountains where George O'Keefe's ranch is, which is very interesting. Yeah, we're going to try to make a side trip there. I'm going to be there for a few days with my friend Patrick, who's also an artist and also obsessed with Alexander Girard as an influence. So, but there are so many other artists out there who, like Mary Blair, who was an illustrator in the mid century, she designed a lot of the stuff that we see at Disneyland. She was a children's book illustrator. I absolutely love Andy Warhol. My work looks nothing like his, but I tend to love artists who are either from the mid-century or artists who have a graphic design, a very bold and graphic look to their work. I also have always been really influenced by folk art in general, and folk art is like a more of a genre, and it's a genre that crosses so many different cultures, so there are so many iterations of it. I think one of the most important parts of my journey was you know, acknowledging that I had these influences and then kind of using them in strategic ways. 
you know, how does this person use color? How does this person achieve a powerful image? And looking and studying that instead of trying to copy the work directly. I've sat down and literally copied, you know, folk art from the 1800s just as an exercise in my sketchbook, for sure. It is a very important part of learning that you do learn a lot more from copying because you're involving all your senses to really study. It's like, it's a form of studying the copying. It is, it is. And that's why artists for centuries have copied, shouldn't be then turning around and that is your your product. Yeah, or that you sell it, right? Yeah, I agree. I think it's an important exercise. I have these are strategies for navigating influence in my book and a lot of them are just things I already talked about, like just owning it, right? And not thinking of it as something to be ashamed of and just understanding that, that everybody experiences it. I always say, you know, get to know and honor your influences, write them letters. I think especially now in the age of Pinterest, we have this tendency to find work that we like and pin it, right? And we have style boards. Sometimes they're actual physical pin boards. Sometimes they're virtual pin boards. You can even bookmark things on Instagram now. But what I encourage people to do is like dive into that artist, find out who they are, who influenced them. Who are other contemporaries of theirs that you might also be interested in learning more about? So really kind of blow open your influences because the more you go from sort of one person to an entire genre or way of working, the more your work will sort of settle into that genre as opposed to looking exactly like one other person's work. I think it's great to have influences where people sometimes run into danger is getting inspiration from going to Pinterest or Instagram. So be influenced and let that seep into your subconscious. But when you're ready to go get inspired, find a different activity. Go out for a walk, do something physical, read a book, see a play, engage a different sense or have a different experience that doesn't involve looking at other people's, if we're talking about painting, looking at other people's paintings. That's right. And I also, like one suggestion I have too, is diving into history and architecture and things like folk art that are super old or Mm -hmm. things from, you know, studying ancient culture versus more other contemporary artists like that. If you need visual inspiration, go to places that are sort of beyond your favorite list of contemporary artists. For sure. So one question I had for you is in chapter five of the book, you talk about the importance of showing up, which I always like to say, like the Woody Allen quote that showing up is 80% of life. Yes. And the importance of practicing and setting routines. But what I'm really curious about, Lisa, is what your routine is right now Mm -hmm. for your artistic practice. And if you could also talk about how you're balancing your art making with your writing. That's a really good question. It's also super relevant to where I am right now. My routine changes based on what my workload looks like. And my workload will look very similar for weeks or sometimes months at a time. And then it changes once things, once I sort of transition from certain projects. But right now I'm both, well, I'm actually only working on writing one book, but I'm working on illustrating two that are already written. And the two that you're illustrating, that's client work. Is that correct? Well, one is my my own book and one is a book that I'm illustrating for someone else. So I'm writing a book that I haven't illustrated yet that is actually light on the writing. What I'm about to explain my routine. And so imagine the routine I'm about to explain where the majority of that routine was taken up with writing, where now it's more heavy on the illustration. Um, depending on what phase of a book I'm working on, Sometimes my work hours, like my office hours, as I like to call them, are really all about writing. And some phases, I get to draw more. And I actually like both a lot. People ask me all the time, like, oh, you know, I hate writing. Like, do you hate the periods where you're actually working on the writing of a book? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, I like it. I actually find it refreshing. And sometimes I find it even easier (laughs) than drawing. But right now, so I'm working on writing one book. I'm thinking about the illustrations as I write it. And then another book I've been working on for three years. It's an encyclopedia of the periodic table of elements. It's a kid's book for sort of like 10 to 14 year olds. So that's completely written and about half of it is illustrated. So between now and the end of the summer, I have to finish illustrating that. And then I'm working on illustrating a book, a children's book by Jennifer Ward 
that is a book for toddlers. So the illustrations are actually super different than the ones in the science book, which have to be more realistic. Mm. Ones in the book for toddlers it, are very stylized and kind of fun. And I kind of have way more freedom to do what I want to do. I have four nephews, by the way. So <laughs> hurry up because I, <laughs> I know, know exactly who would, who should get each of those books. I think they both come out in about a year. So oh, okay. I'll keep you all posted. So every morning I get up around... 5, 30 or 6. Most days I go to the gym. I am kind of an avid cyclist. So I also go to spin class. And so I get my workout, have my coffee first, drink a smoothie. And then I get home and I take a shower and I start my work day. And I have this, for the next three months, I have mostly blocked off every morning. So I like to work in time blocks. So nice. every morning I work from about 8.30 to noon set the timer for periods of time, which changes depending on what I'm working on. And I'm either writing, as I said, or right now I'm mostly illustrating and I'll switch back and forth between both books. My, I'm really lucky that I have a brain that shifts easily from one task to another. Some people have to work on the same thing or it drives them crazy. They, you know, and everybody's brain is different. I have trouble context switching. So it's hard for me yeah. sometimes to go between marketing the tasks I need to do to market my art and creating art, I find it's very different. It's not that I don't enjoy marketing the art. The problem is just the opposite. It's like once I get into that mode, it's hard to shut it down. You know, I think the key is like figuring out, observing yourself and like, when are you the most productive, you know? Mm. And then I stop for lunch. And then for the next three months, I also have dedicated to the extent that I can, afternoons are sort of for creative like working in my studio with my hands. I really have gotten away from that a lot. I'm taking a break from client work, like you named some of my clients in the introduction. I've spent so much of the last 12 years of my career working for clients. Mm -hmm. And the more you're doing commissioned illustration work, the further away you can also get from your own personal work, for, which for me is both fine art and also just making stuff to sell things that I can make prints and products out of myself. So I'm super excited because... I have enough time in my schedule now, even with these three books, to carve out time in the afternoon to do that kind of work. I also own a store or I have a store in the front of my studio. So on um, two afternoons a week, that's open. But when there's no customers there, I'm hopefully making stuff or I'm doing stuff like you were talking about, like figuring out how to market things. What am I going to post on Instagram tomorrow? And like preparing my my posts. And you have help with that, right? You have a studio assistant? I do have a studio manager. She doesn't do any of my social media, but okay. she runs my online shop. She runs my retail shop. She keeps all of my inventory and makes sure that we've got everything in stock. She also does product development and research for me. She does some graphic design work for me. So She's instrumental to my business. And I, after, you know, many years of not having help because I couldn't afford it, I feel super lucky. And then I try to wind up my day. You know, of course there's email and admin. And so every day I deal with that a little differently, but I carve out time to make, you know, to answer interview questions or respond to emails and fulfill client requests and, you know, press requests and those kinds of things. In the fall, I'm going on a, a book tour for Find Your Artistic Voice. So I'll be on the road a lot. And that's part of why I'm trying to sort of, for lack of a better word, plow through all the other books that I'm working on now so that I can kind of get them to a point where when I'm traveling, I'm not stressing about working at the same time. Yeah. And when's the Santa Fe trip fit into? Oh, that's in August and it's only four days. So I'm really around the rest of the summer and I've been traveling a lot for the last few months. So it's actually kind of, I love being home and I'm sort of a homebody, but traveling has become this sort of natural extension of what I do. I do a lot of public speaking and I get invited to teach workshops and do things like that. And, and I enjoy those things too. So I'll go through a period where I'm on a lot of airplanes and then I purposefully don't sign up for anything that requires me to leave home for like two or three months so that I can get grounded again and I can get, you know, really get into a period of productivity with my work, which you can't do when you're constantly stopping and starting. So I'm entering one of those periods and I'm really excited about it. Does your wife like to travel with you? Yeah, you know, as often as she can, you know, if I can get her to come to a conference with me, we obviously take vacations together, but like, I'm speaking at Adobe Max in this fall and turns out she can come and we got her a ticket. So she really tries. She also has a job that is demanding. 
I think she'd like to travel with me more than she actually does, to be honest, but she's got responsibilities, so she can't always come. And I've gotten so used to traveling by myself that it's sort of not a big deal to me anymore. My husband actually doesn't like to travel. I mean, we'll take a trip. We take our vacations together, but I'll do these kind of work vacations, kind of make them up for myself. When I went to Santa Fe, I decided that was for work. That's where you get your inspiration. And I think those are incredibly important. That's my Santa Fe trip is the same thing. In fact, next year, I'm taking what I'm calling a client sabbatical. And it's really just a sabbatical from client work. I'm still going to do other things and completely run my business. I'm hoping that with that much less sort of on my plate that I can travel more because as artists, like, you know, we were talking earlier about finding inspiration, like really, if you're able to do it or save the money to do it, you know, even getting out of your town to the next town over or, you know, going into nature, much less like getting on an airplane and flying to a different country, it can do wonders. I completely agree. It really does open you up to new experiences and, and usually the better kind of experiences rather than the other kind of experience. There's a saying I have that experience is sometimes what you get when you don't get what you want. Right. But travel is not that kind usually. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So Lisa's book is available today, today, meaning the day Lisa's giving me a strange look. We can see each other. (laughs) The day that the podcast airs is timed on the day that it's released. Wow. Yes. So we were able to do that because of advanced planning. So thank you, Lisa. So you can order it right now and it's in bookstores too, I assume. Yes. Okay. So you can, can order on, you know, on Amazon and make Jeff Bezos really rich. And I get to earn a dollar from that. If you buy it in the show notes at shulmanheart.com forward slash 49, or you can just go and support your local bookstore. All good. No judgment. Exactly. And the book is called find your artistic voice. The link is in the show notes, shulmanheart.com forward slash 49. And I also put it on my book club page, shulmanheart.com forward slash book club. All right, Lisa, do you have any last words for my listeners before we call this podcast complete? This idea of finding your style or your voice, you know, part of the reason I wrote a book about it is because people were coming to me and saying like, how do I do this? I think that a lot of people think it's a mysterious process and there are actually practical things you can do. And one of them is just like working in spurts, like a 30 day spurt where you work on one thing for 30 days every day, you know, doing a a daily challenge, showing up every day and forcing yourself through practice. Because really the way to find your voice, you know, I would say if I could like summarize the book in one sentence, it's like, show up, do the work, feel the fear and do it anyway. Eventually you'll get there. I'm sure people listening know that when they have attempted to practice something over and over and over, they've gotten better at it. And that's because it's impossible whether you're learning to be a good cook or get better at running or swimming, or art, like showing up and practicing is actually the key to finding your, you know, or uncovering your voice, right? As you said, that's my little spiel. <laughs> I love that. And the book is awesome. She includes not just her own sage advice, but also there's a really nice curated collection from, from different artists. So Lisa was, kind, yeah. Yeah, Lisa was kind enough to send me an advanced copy. I did go ahead and order it myself so I can get my physical copy because I can't wait to see the illustrations in color on the page. So mm-hmm. real exciting. Thanks again so much for joining me today, Lisa. It was really my pleasure. Thank you. To wrap this all up, I want to ask you if you are subscribed to my podcast. Next week is episode number 50. And to celebrate, I'm bringing on a special guest. Next week, I'm having on my husband, Ronald Schulman. And it's not just because he's super cute and hunky or because he paid me. It's because we're publishing an art and poetry book together. And our book goes live next week. By the way, you can pre-order the book right now. It's called The Writer's Sketch. So go to Amazon. You can order Lisa's book and then add The Writer's Sketch also to your shopping cart. Oh, yeah. And one more thing. The ebook. Don't forget, you can get $18 off. Use the promo code Inspire Me. There's definitely some concrete strategies you can use that will complement what we talked about today. Thanks so much for joining me here today. I will see you same time, same place next week. Make it a great one. Bye for now. Bye.
Thank you for listening to the Inspiration Place podcast. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shulmanart, on Instagram at shulmanart, and of course, on shulmanart.com. The writer sketch goes live next week, but you can actually pre-order the book, either a Kindle version, or you can pre-order the paperback version directly from me on my website. You'll find the links to that over at shulmanart.com forward slash poetry book.